You're listening to another episode of our PAC Politics Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Our podcast is brought to you by our organization, our United Resource PAC. We are a tax-exempt political organization. Hello, and thank you again so much for tuning in today, guys. My name is Brittany McDowell. I am your host, among many, many, many other things. And again, I very much appreciate you taking this uh I don't, you know, I don't even know how to describe today, right? Um, A lot of us are probably feeling a lot of emotions. Um, On Saturday, we officially received the notification that projections show us that the 46th president of our great America, our great United States of America, is going to be none other than president-elect Joe Biden. I am very, very happy to hear this. I think that um, Joe Biden is exactly what our country needs at this time. And I'm looking very much forward to his administration. That said, as great as, as I know he will be, as great as I know that his administration will be, uh, and as much as I want to talk about that, I think that that's not what we're going to talk about today. Today, we're going to talk about the fact that there are various forms of stimulus that are ending um, come December 31st of this year. Um, as you all probably are aware, just because the announcement came that uh, Joe Biden will be our 46th president, no matter what kind of lawsuits come out today, right? Um, Even though it looks like he is our man. He is going to be our commander in chief and get rid of the COVID in chief that is currently serving. Um, Unfortunately, we have to deal with COVID in chief, uh, our current COVID in chief uh, for another 70 some odd days. Uh, And as a result of what has happened recently, uh, not just with the COVID in chief's administration, but uh, what has happened with Congress, this current Congress, which is now in a lame duck session, uh, their failure to give us some sort of a stimulus package has led to, again, various forms of stimulus uh, actually phasing out the end of this year. And so um, I've mentioned before on the show that a stimulus package does not just talk about one thing. It actually includes many, many things. We've talked about some of those things, but I want to make it very clear that key components, um, that you're aware of some of the key components of previous stimulus under the CARES Act, I want you to be aware that they are phasing out in case you happen to be impacted by any of these. I don't want you to be caught off surprise, uh, caught off, you know, caught off guard and surprised. I don't want you in a position where you were completely just uh, bewildered by what is about to happen to many, 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 many people given what has happened. And it's not just about the fact that, you know, uh, in the past we didn't come up with a stimulus package. It's also about the fact that it is unlikely, as I've discussed in recent episodes, it's unlikely that we are going to get stimulus during this lame duck session. So I've spent enough time on this intro. Hopefully you are well aware of what we're going to be talking about. This is going to be a little bit longer than a normal episode. Um, I've got about, I think about like seven segments planned, but sit back, Uh, And, you know, take a listen because, again, I'm pretty sure as an American during this difficult time for our country, if you're not impacted by all of these programs we're going to talk about, you or someone you know and love are more likely than not impacted by at least one. So pay attention. And again, thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of our PAC Politics Podcast. All right, so stimulus is phasing out. Everyone knows that there were various forms of stimulus that Americans were, uh, I guess you'd say, afforded given the battering we are taking as a nation. Our economy is under uh, uh, going through uh, 
man, right? We're just being battered. Our house is on fire. Uh, but again, Congress did come together under the CARES Act and they did put together a set of programs and plans to, to really try and stimulate the American economy. Um, various forms of, of stimulus have phased out already, but we are approaching a period during the next, what, less than two months where um, essentially key components of stimulus are going to be kind of phasing out. And so, um, look, you know, again, we've got less than two months, I, I think specifically somewhere around what, seven weeks, six weeks. Well, that's not too specific, is it? <laughs> but, um, so we don't have a lot of time and I really want you to make use of this time because again, we're going to talk specifically about some of these programs and forms of stimulus. And I want you to pay attention because if you are impacted, if you're taking advantage of, I don't want to say that taking advantage, that sounds so, so negative, right? And you already have politicians saying you're taking advantage, but if you are, utilizing some of the programs that are being extended to you as a citizen of this country. Let's put it like that, right? Uh, if you're utilizing some of these forms of stimulus, I don't want you to be caught off guard. And I want you to make use of the time that you have remaining. Because look, um, you know, we've talked a lot about you know, businesses. And we've talked a lot about how as a result of them failing to receive economic stimulus, a lot of businesses have had to close. A lot of industries are heavily impacted. A lot of industries are like, look, we cannot make it. Our doors are going to close. We've got to lay off loads and loads of employees. But we haven't really taken a look at what happens, at least um, in a very specific fashion, as it relates to people. So obviously we talk about how, you know, when people lose their jobs, they end up on unemployment. They have to get housing assistance. They have to get, uh, you know, food assistance by using the SNAP program. Um, they, they have to make use of a lot of, you know, um, government programs that are available to them as citizens of this country as they very well should be. However, what we don't often hear talked about is the fact that at a certain point, even with those forms of support, uh, a lot of Americans have had to or will end up having to essentially file for bankruptcy, right? You know, businesses, they, you know, either go in bankruptcy and sometimes depending on the form of bankruptcy, you're able to kind of restructure so on and so forth. Um, and, or they end up just outright closing their doors, but we don't talk about the fact that that happens to people, but look, here's the deal in the words of, in the words of our, uh, president elect, right? Here's the deal. Um, as it relates to personal economies, we are going to start seeing a lot of people having to file for personal bankruptcy. That has been projected. And this is, especially when you consider one of the forms of uh, economic stimulus that um, is ending, and that is that kind of eviction moratorium, that eviction ban that actually ended but was uh, kind of reinstated by the CDC. Um, a lot of people, you know, they're up for eviction soon, right? Uh, and with them being up for eviction, one of the ways, one of their options that won't necessarily keep them from being evicted, but at least buy them some more time, uh, is, is, uh, going ahead and filing for bankruptcy. There is a certain level of protection that they'll be afforded if they file for bankruptcy that they won't have if they just kind of let the eviction play out. And quite frankly, you know, our species is all about survival, right? And you cannot blame people uh, if they have to utilize a tool uh, such as bankruptcy as a means of simply trying to survive. No, a lot of people don't, you know, look at bankruptcy and say, oh, I'm going to do that so I can just make all my obligations disappear. For a lot of people, they end up going that route because of the protections afforded to them that they wouldn't have if they have to go down a road anyway. They're going to lose everything anyway. At least they can do it while they are afforded a certain level of protection that they would not otherwise have. Now, you know, one of the things that we've heard time and time again, uh, as we wind down the time that we have left 
uh, where we are, you know, stimulating our economy uh, nationally is we've heard about, you know, or, or we've heard politicians say, you know, well, we're just kind of taking, you know, different approaches to this. We specifically heard this when in the very beginning, uh, Republicans, specifically Senate Republicans, said that they wanted to have a quote unquote targeted, it's a nice way of saying uh, smaller. Uh, they wanted to have a smaller stimulus package um, as opposed to a larger stimulus package that was desired by the Democrats, specifically those in the House. And so during that time, we really, especially when they, when the Senate Republicans were trying to explain kind of where they were coming from, one of the kind of explanations that they used was that, well, look, we want to start with a number first, and then we want to kind of go from there and allocate funds. And they said Nancy Pelosi, on the other hand, her approach was to allocate funds and then ultimately end up with a number. Um, now, you know, you, I mean, you definitely could have a conversation about those approaches, but I want to make this very clear, right? The fact that we are uh, uh, coming to this point where we are no longer going to be stimulating our economy, this is not because approaches are competing. This is not because the ways in which we want to do something are competing. This is not a situation where we say, we're going, we're, we're looking to make a cake as a country, but we, you know, want to do step A first instead of step B. No, uh, what we are dealing with is essentially differences in a differences of opinion about the type of cake we want, the size of the cake we want. It's not just a matter of a, a difference of opinion on the steps that we are taking. Right. So I want you to be very, very clear when you hear again, when you hear people, whether it's politicians or pundits, try to explain away our, again, lack of ability to stimulate our economy going forward. It is not because, metaphorically speaking, we disagree on the steps A, B and C that we want to take to bake our cake, our cake of economic strength and wealth and vitality. No, it is because we disagree on the ingredients of the cake. We disagree on the temperature of the oven. We disagree on the size of the pan. We disagree on the tools. Some people want to use a fork. Some people want to use a spatula. Some people want to, you know, pound out the, um, what is it when you, after you mix together the dough and then you like, I don't bake because I am horribly horrible at it. But my sister, who is an awesome baker, what she does is I notice like after she um, whips together her, what's that stuff called? The, it's not dough for a cake. It's a, the batter. She like takes it and she like pounds it out, like to get the air bubbles out. Right. You know, we have people disagreeing. Some people want to do that. Some people want to leave the bubbles in. That is what we are, are disagreeing on. We're not disagreeing on, oh, well, do we, you know, crack the egg first? No. So do not let them fool you thinking that this is simply about approaches. This is about different values. This is about, you know, Diff, uh, just a, a whole host of differences. It's not as simple as they would like to explain it away. Um, look, the size of the stimulus matters, right? If we go back to that cake example, um, if you decide, for instance, not to uh, take your pan and kind of drop it on your counter a few times, you're going to have air bubbles that's going to affect your cake. If you decide not to add flour to your cake, will it even still be called a cake? If you decide to, um, you know, I don't know, not put enough, what do they put in cakes? Again, I don't bake. Do they put baking powder in it? If you decide to not put an egg in it, I'm sure it's going to turn out horrible, right? If you decide to use, you know, one flour versus another type of flour, there are a whole host of different things. This is not as simple as they make it appear. So when they tell you that, oh, well, you know, the size doesn't really matter if we just do A, B, and C, that's again, that's the equivalent of baking a cake, but deciding to do everything except maybe add the flour. You might end up with something similar to a cake, but it sure in the heck will not be a cake, right? So if we go along with stimulus and we don't have certain aspects, various important aspects, we are not truly going to end up with economic stimulus. We'll end up with something that is maybe similar, 
but it's either not the same or it's not as effective, right? We need a large stimulus package. The size of the package matters, you know, and it's not just about getting a large package just for the sake of it having being, you know, uh, large, like the actual, we have to be strategic about the size, right? We don't just want something large again for the sake of it being large. You know, it's, you know, <laughs> Oh, Lord. It, OK, I'm not even going to say that example. But um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, you, you you don't just want something large. You want to know what you're doing with what, you know, OK, right. I'm going to leave that alone. So if we if we have something and we have something that's large enough and we were st strategic in calculating what was needed um, and here's the key thing, we implemented it in a way that makes sense. We implement it wisely. All of those things, again, it's not one thing, but all of those things together, and I'm sure among other things, they all correlate to the overall impact of what we get as a result of what we do. Again, I have used several times the example of, for instance, a burning house. Some pe everyone is is they're able to say, I put water on the house, but some people want to take a bucket of water and throw it a one single bucket and say, well, see, I put water on the fire. Another group of people want to take a hose, a water hose that continuously streams water, you know? And as a result, again, both people can accurately say, well, see, I did put water on it. But the impact of both of those actions are going to be very, very different because they ultimately are... Um, they're ultimately not the same thing despite being the same thing. So that said, I'm going to leave that here. Just again, keep in mind that we have less than two months to go uh, that we are going to be stimulating our economy. And so put your whole uh, personal economy together. Think about, you know, the plans you need to make. I'm sure a lot of you are, have had to make plans a long time ago because you've been suffering for a long time. Your personal economy has been uh, without stimulus for a very long time. But I want you to be very, very, very aware of what's going on. And also, as I've mentioned on several episodes before, just because Joe Biden gets elected or he he will, you know, take the oath of office and be the man of the hour uh, on January 20th at 12 p.m., that does not mean that at that very moment uh, it is going to be raining checks. You need to be have a plan to deal with the lack of stimulus that at the very least goes into March and April. Right. So keep that in mind, because we have less than two months of economic stimulus left. So we don't yet know what the plans are of President elect Joe Biden regarding economic stimulus for our country. Um, I can pretty safely uh, assume, uh, based on the type of man that we know, um, both as on a personal level as well as politically, uh, as a politician, based on the type of man we know we are dealing with, one that is tried, true, and trusted, I am very well aware that his intention to adequately stimulate our economy is going to be noted in genuine efforts that I believe we will immediately see once he takes his oath of office. I, I also believe that we're going to start hearing about plans well before that occurs. But I want to speak very briefly about the president-elect Joe Biden's economic stimulus plans. First and foremost, let me say, we don't know what those plans are, okay? So I don't want you to think that I'm like being clickbaity, that I am, you know, disclosing something that other people don't, I, I don't know. Look, I don't know, right? But there, there is something that I want to say here, okay? We know that he's coming into office with plans that are going to be his own, that are going to be forceful, that are going to be more adequate than what we have, you know, seen from COVID and Chief's current administration. Now, um, I want to make this very clear, right? And I've said this about COVID and Chief. Let me step away from that name for a moment and actually call him President Trump. Um, I, when it comes to President Trump, I've said the same thing. And I want to make it very, very, very clear about President-elect Joe Biden as well. Okay. 
well, let me kind of backtrack, okay? We know that President-elect Joe Biden will not be our man. We will not go from COVID in chief, what we have now, to commander in chief until January 20th at 12 p.m. Set your clocks. Let's get ready and let's have a collective shout as a nation at 12, right? They need to hear it from space. Um, But I want to give some caution, okay? Just as we have dealt with a situation recently, as has been the case of our country, we have dealt with a situation where our commander in chief cannot act alone on specific issues, especially again, and and explicitly this issue of uh, economic stimulus. He can't do that by himself. COVID in chief, President Trump has not been able to give us uh, economic stimulus, which I'll mention later on, I genuinely believe that he tried to do, but for his own selfish reasons, um, COVID in chief tried to give us stimulus. He couldn't do it. Joe Biden will not be able on his own, no matter how grandiose his plans, no matter how uh, great his plans will be, no matter how much his plans will make America great again, right? Joe Biden will not be able by his lonesome, even as our commander in chief, to give us economic stimulus. He does need, and this is where I give caution to everybody, he does need, he requires consensus from the House of Representatives, at least a majority there. He also requires consensus from the Senate, a majority there as well. And so without either, we have to have three legs on this stool. Is it, is it really a stool? No, it's a tripod, right? We have to have three legs to this tripod, the House, Senate, and the President. If any portions of those stool or of of those of that tripod decide to collapse and not provide support the tripod does not stand so if the house and the senate come together and they say hey let's do this but president elect joe biden says hey i'm not doing it it won't stand if the senate and joe biden our president elect decide to do something and the house opposes the tripod will not stand And if the House and President-elect Joe Biden come to a consensus and decide, hey, we need a a roaring stimulus package to get our economy going, but the Senate, as has been the historical norm of this past congressional session, if they decide that they are opposed to supporting the case, the cause, the economic stimulus, the tripod, the efforts, the economic stimulus will not be supported, okay? So I want you to go into this knowing what we are getting ourselves into. I want you to go into this for knowing this for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, because the opposition, sorry, it was I did my best to put my phone on silent, you know, the little button on the side that you flip, go into silent mode. I swear I did that, but I had an alarm that I did not pay attention to. Um, I even put a thing on my team to like, do not, in Microsoft Teams, do not message me. I am doing the podcast. I thought I was being smart, but I still was outsmarted by technology. Okay, so back to what I was saying. I, I, I wanted to make this clear because there, there, there are some things that I believe you need to know. Um, the opposition, just as we had seen the groundwork being laid for COVID in chief, President Trump uh, making the case that the election was stolen by kind of sowing seeds of, you know, distrust in our economic, in our electoral process and so on and so forth. We saw the seeds and I, I promise you, if you go back to several episodes, you've heard me saying he is setting the stage for X, Y, and Z. And that's exactly what happened. Not that I'm some prophet, not that I'm so amazing, but I mean, it was not hard to figure it out, right? I'm not a political operative and a political, you know, and it was not hard to figure out. Same is, is, is same can be said here. We can see what will happen. What will happen is if, President-elect Joe Biden comes into this with the House on board, which you know he has on lock with Nancy Pelosi, and they 
come prepared, plan in hand, pin ready to go, shoes ready to run on January 20th, and ready with something by 12.01 p.m. to go and, and put in the house. You were going to have opposition like you have never seen before in the Senate. Okay? Um, just go back and look at what happened with what we all refer to as Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act. A lot of people, it cracks me up that a lot of people think that the Affordable Care Act was actually some sort of like democratic, you know, um, ideal, this thing that Democrats really, really wanted. Democrats actually wanted to take health care in this country a lot more towards uh, a single payer system. What we actually have, given a record number of filibusters that President Obama was subjected to with that his Congress at the time, given with just mass amounts of opposition, uh, right? People who from the very beginning said, look, we're going to make it our mission. Our mission is not to govern. Our mission is to actually to oppose at every point in turn, right? Then you you ended up with, you know, a lot of Democrats thinking, oh, well, you know, they really didn't want to give us something better. Actually, they did, but they just kind of had to settle. Uh, then you ended up with, you know, some Republicans saying, see, they, they really didn't want to do it. They just really wanted to sell you a pipe dream and no, you know, a lot of people don't understand that there's opposition that happens. And that's exactly, before I go off on a tangent on that, that's exactly what we're seeing here. Well, not so, so much. We haven't quite seen the level of vitriol that we saw, for instance, with Republicans at the time with Obama, for whatever reason, make your own assumptions. But uh, we don't see the same level of vitriol um, that we saw against Obama while he was president elect, uh, elect, excuse me, elect, what the heck is elect? Is that even a word? Uh, but we don't see that same level of vitriol under with president elect, not elect, elect Joe Biden that we saw under uh, before we were exposed to Obama's first term, president Obama's first term. And so I think it's safe to assume that the well, I, you know, we can't say it's safe to assume that he won't undergo, uh, you know, as much opposition, right? Maybe they learned from their mistake then and they kind of saw that it was bad PR. It was a bad look because we know politics is all about perception. Maybe they saw that it was a bad look for them after the fact that they had kind of announced that that's what they wanted to do. Maybe they wised up and they decided we're not going to do that this time because we'll just kind of play the dumb role and just, oh, that's not what we plan to do. Knowing good and well that that's what they plan to do from the get, right? But so we don't know, but I do know this, right? We are going to see a situation where I don't know how much opposition President-elect Joe Biden is going to have to contend with regarding whatever his stimulus plans are, but he is going to have to contend with some, okay? Especially because the Senate is is poised to remain under uh, Republican control, most likely under the leadership of Turtle. Excuse me, that is so disrespectful. Um Brittany, why did you say that? Uh, Senator Mitch McConnell, right? So, um, I, you know, I like that was I, I genuinely and like apologizing. I should not have said that. That was that was horribly rude. So. Um, so anywho, because because we are going to be contending with Mitch McConnell, there is going to be oppos opposition. But I will say this. Uh, and I, I said it very, very, very early on um, when we still were. Uh, in a position where there were loads of contenders for the Democratic nomination, that uh, as much as various factions of the Democrats wanted to pull the Democratic Party more left, and if you look at some of what they've been saying, the lot like uh, I heard AOC, she recently made the comment that um, you know had uh, they actually uh, put more left, if they basically put more left-leaning uh, candidates up, if they had a more progressive left-leaning agenda that they would have done better, I beg to disagree. Um, the reason that I proposed, and I'm just going to kind of end with this kind of tangent here, the reason that I proposed way back when, even when I, you know, even when our, I, and I proposed this at a time when our organization was 
focused on other issues. We weren't even yet focused on COVID-19 economic stimulus and relief. I said that Joe Biden is the Democrats' best hope to contend with President Trump. And the reason is because President-elect Joe Biden, he is he is your centrist Democrat, right? He is, when you think of kind of the old-time Democrats, when you think of Democrats that could appeal to moderate Republicans, to, you know, re- you know, Republicans who might even be Republicans in name only, not like super Republican or, and even those who, again, are like those kind of middle of the line Republicans. Joe Biden was the only one that the Democrats had this year who could even remotely appeal to, and everyone else too extreme to pull other people over. And one of the things that I think that the Republicans are very, very, uh, uh, very right about when they talk about is the fact that when you leave these big cities of America and you go into these smaller towns, these rural areas, and even these medium sized cities, you will find that America does not all look like San Francisco. And I don't mean just like literally, I mean in terms of ideals and values, not that it's all great, not that it's all bad, right? It's just based on where people are, they tend to have different values for different reasons. Sometimes those values are okay and sometimes, you know, they're not. But it is, in the words of the president, in the words of, uh, words of COVID in chief, it is what it is. And so the, the Republicans, one thing that I will say is that they talk about this a lot, at least they used to when they were actually the Republican Party and not what they are now. Because quite honestly, when I think of a Republican, I think of like John McCain. I think of, you know, actual like Republicans, Republicans who were decent, who actually believed in the ideas they were espousing. What you have now is a complete and utter circus, right? You know, you need the Michael Steeles to take that party back. You need people who uh, genuinely understand what it is to be a Republican to take that party back. Because the fear that I have is while, and I, and, and let me say this, I'm not one to kind of play the both sides. Oh, both Democrats are Republicans and, you know, they're both good and bad. But genuinely, there are ideals from the left, from the Democrats that are good, and there are also genuine ideals from the right that are good. But what I fear is that we have, over the last, and it's extended beyond the last four years, it, it kind of, um, and I've again, I, I understand I've gone off way on a tangent here. I was supposed to be talking about President-elect Joe Biden, but this has to be said. When you, it cracks me up that people think that what we are seeing now in terms of the Republican Party and what it is, and I'm using Eric quotes to say Republican Party, it is not something that just came along with Trump in the last four years, right? We had Trumpism before Trump came along, and that Trumpism was uh, in opposition to Barack Obama, right? Remember he when he was or when he was in, in opposition to pre- then President Obama, you know, saying, "Oh, we need a birth certificate. You're not an American," and da, 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 putting all these conspiracies. That's what we had then, right? But even before that, before Trumpism started, then what did we have then? We had the Tea Party, right? When you look at when you kind of look at kind of what we've seen in recent years from the, the, the Republican Party, this isn't something that just popped up. And and those of those of you wrongly, you know, and it may be out of ignorance and, and, and ignorance is not a bad. I understand that we've like demonized the word ignorance, but we're all ignorant to something, myself included. I'm ignorant of a whole heck of a lot. But when you look at what we have seen in the last at least 10 years from the Republican Party. This has been a slow kind of process, but it's picked up steam over the last few years and it's been emboldened under Trump, right? And so the fear that I have on a personal level, especially because I realize that there are things that I personally agree with. I personally agree that some of the values in terms of like traditional and family values 
I fall more in line personally with the Republican Party on those. You know, have your own personal opinion. You know, think that the tree outside can be your mom and then the car can be your dad. Do what you want to do. But for me, I tend to fall in line with more uh, Republican values around definitions of family, uh, as well as kind of, uh, kind of the impact that I, I would say that Republicans tend to, uh, agree that, uh, a family has on an overall community and ultimately our country. Um, this is just my personal opinion. This is not the opinion of the organization, but, that considered, I think it's unfortunate that a, 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 a party that had those types of ideals, while it had many ideals that were wrong, um, and, and I will say this on a kind of another tangent, I think a lot of ideals that we're subscribing to the party now are not ideals that are genuinely part of the Republican Party. They have come along with this kind of morphed addition to the Republican Party. And I blame the real Republicans for not standing up against it and thinking that they could capitalize on it for short-term gain in terms of votes and take advantage of those people because that's exactly what they were doing. Uh, and now you, you, you've made your bed. You've got to lie, lie with it, lie in it. You can't you can't, you've married this, this, this thing, right? And it's a little too late for a divorce, right? It made you sign a prenup. It is threatening to shoot you if you try to get a divorce. It has taken out a life insurance policy and said, look, if you want to, you know, get a divorce, that's fine, but I'm going to kill you and I'm going to take all your money, right? That's exactly what these new, these new, uh, this, this thing that has attached itself to the Republican Party. And, and I caution people from calling what we are seeing now the Republican Party. Not saying that I think it will actually help real Republicans detach, but I think that those who truly can, again, look back at the last at least 10 years and understand what we've seen, you know, Tea Party, Trump, and kind of we've seen this kind of whole QAnon. It's all the same thing, just under a different name. What is what is, I, I think it's in the Bible. It says like there's nothing new under the sun, right? Like it's true. This is this is this stuff is not new. This stuff is what we had ten years ago, right? But what I fear is that even with you know there's been talks of Donald Trump coming back and or covid in chief coming back in 2024 uh and you know i have ha i have heard it said that the problem he may contend with is that uh he is even even with twitter you know and we don't know how long he's going to be able to last on twitter not having the uh, protections of being an elected official like will he actually be held accountable for violations of terms of service you know who knows but if he is able to kind of stand on twitter and kind of keep a hold on the american people in that way not saying that many people are going to care as many as in the future as they do now uh, the question is, will he still be relevant in 2024? But the problem is going to be for those actual real Republicans that are still out there, they are not going to be able to, and I hope that they are not living in with this delusion that they can now just kind of say, okay, crazy is gone. Let's try and take our party back. Like he tried to take the country. You have married yourself to this man. Think about how many QAnon Tea Party people have been elected into political office now. You cannot get away from that. And I think it's so unfor unfortunate because if it were early on, I honestly believe that they literally could have forced these people out. Like literally, go call yourself something else. Do not call yourself a Republican. But it is too late for that now. Where they go from here, I don't know. But I do know that leadership in the Republican Party need to, while they have failed to want to come together and get a unified plan for COVID-19, they need to come together and get a unified plan for their party. One that acknowledges that Trumpism, Tea Partyism, QAnonism is alive and well within their party, not because it is genuinely part of it, but because they have allowed it to seep in. Take response, take what's the phrase that they use all the time? Personal responsibility. Take personal responsibility for it. Come up with a plan 
then and only then can you actually hopefully make something happen. I, and I, there really is no guarantee. I don't know. Literally, I question, is this is this a situation where the Republican Party is going to have to not literally, but figuratively, figuratively die and almost reinvent itself in a way that purges that negativity, not saying that you have to come to agree with a lot of this stuff that the other side agree agrees with. That's not what I'm saying. And, and there will be a lot of people who try and use this time or this argument to say, see, you need to come over to the left and agree with all of our stuff. No, 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 no. Because I said earlier, and I very well mean, and it's very, very well true. What plays in San Francisco does not play in Odessa, Texas. What plays in Los Angeles does not play in, I don't know, what's another place? Does not play in some parts of Mississippi and vice versa. That doesn't mean that one place is wrong. One per- It's just there's different strokes for different folks. And that's one of the amazing things about America. And I think it's unfortunate that we have to have kind of these competing interests. And, and I know that as the president says, as COVID in chief says with, you know, with with other stuff, but related to this, it is what it is. I don't think that we'll ever kind of div- be able to divorce the fact uh, that uh, there will be competing interests with our politics. I mean, heck, there's competing interests with our species, right? Uh, but it is what it is. But we have to find a way to make it work because it can't be this whole, you know, and I've used this example before, and I'm going to end my, you know, rant here in a minute, but. I've used this before when I talk about how personally and as an organization, we back Nancy Pelosi, not because we agree with her on abortion, not because we agree with her on, you know, a whole bunch of other issues, but simply because on this issue, what is the most pressing issue at this time, hopefully a year from now, this won't be the most pressing issue and we can kind of get to something else. But but you're not realize people you're not married to these politicians right um, and I understand that especially for some of them their personalities can be captivating they can be very charismatic a lot of people need charisma to be able to get to certain levels within politics uh, but you have to be smart enough you have to be willing enough to say look. Just how these people use me when it benefits them, just how I said uh, Republicans utilized this thing that was, again, the Tea Party, Trumpism, uh, QAnonism, they utilized that to get them votes, and now they're trying to divorce it. You have to utilize these politicians and use them exactly how they're using you. Say to yourself, what is the most important issue to me at this moment, and who can help me get what I want to see on this issue? Maybe that means you end up voting for and liking a politician that you otherwise would not necessarily like or vote. Like, like I said, I say all the time, I Nancy Pelosi is probably somewhere in San Francisco on a corner doing drive-by abortions. I genuinely believe that. But that does not discredit the fact Uh, or it does not take away from the fact that on the issue of COVID-19 economic stimulus and relief, despite the fact that I very much believe that abortion is wrong, and that is my personal belief, I'm entitled to it, and I do not need to defend that to anybody, so don't come at me with that, well, abortion, you believe what you want, and I'll believe what I want. Like, it is what it is, and unless I'm, just leave me alone, right? Uh, But even though I believe that, I also believe that she is what we need on this issue. Right. I even believe that she needs to retain her uh, place of leadership within the Democratic Party, within the House, going forward into this new Congress. As much as some people would like to remove her and put more liberal and a younger face in leadership, I believe that would be a true mistake for the Democrats. I really, really do. Not saying that everybody thought that Nancy was a savior in this last session, not saying that there are people who do not blame her for what happened recently. Think what you want, but mark my words. If the Democratic Party is seriously thinking about thinking about putting not just any younger leaders in, in leadership in the House, if you were literally thinking about removing her in this next congressional session, you are doing the Democrats a disservice. And trust me, you will pay for it in the next election. She is a steady hand that the Democrats need. As as much as I meant and I said that they needed Joe Biden, they equally need Nancy Pelosi. And again, this is coming from someone who 
again, very much disagrees with the abortion loving woman, right? Um, but it is what it is. And this is where as Americans, we have to be adult enough to say, look, I disagree with you on X, but you're right on Y. Like a person is not a monster just because they disagree with you on everything. Even when I, for instance, talk about Mitch McConnell that I had to apologize for earlier in this segment, I disagree with him on a lot. And I, but here's the deal. I don't think that he's a monster specifically because we disagree on you know, specific things like, you know, I, we agree on actually probably more than I agree with Nancy about, but on this issue, he has proven not through his words, but through his actions that he is not the, not only is he not the man for the job, but his values are different and, and, and your values extend beyond abortion and transgenders and, you know, whatever else, who you have sex with, this, like your values extend beyond that, right? And if you're voting solely and only based on those issues, you are doing not just yourself a disservice, but you're doing our country a disservice. You are doing democracy disservice because you are letting people take advantage of you and they will do it time and time and time again. It's like that victim who is battered time and time and time again, as much as we sit and we look at that victim who gets battered and beat by her, 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 the offender day in and day out, you can want better for them. You can want them to get out of that situation, but they have to want that for themselves. And you have to want for yourself a situation where politicians understand that they work for you. And when they realize that your allegiance isn't to them, trust and believe that they will start acting like their allegiance is to you. One of the forms of economic stimulus that our country is no longer going to be feeling, right? The, the stimulus is going to be leaving uh, is the 13 weeks of extended unemployment benefits that those who were being able to utilize unemployment assistance uh, are going to be losing. We had the CARES Act, everybody knows about that, and most states on an, on an individual level uh, give residents um, 26 weeks of unemployment assistance. But uh, per the CARES Act, states were able to receive funds that allowed them to extend that, uh, that level of assistance for uh, residents from 26 weeks to 39 weeks. And if you don't know, if you have, if you are receiving unemployment benefits, and this goes for those who were, you know, receiving any type of uh, state unemployment, right? Uh, if you are receiving that unemployment, be aware that the end of this year, the last week of this year is the last week that those benefits are going to be paid out. So if you are, are you know, going to be uh, in that period of extended benefits at that time, be advised that your unemployment benefits are just going to stop. Uh, if you will be getting to the point that you were maybe that next week or, you know, uh, within a few weeks of the end of the year, if you are going to be approaching a time where you should be able to take advantage of those benefits, uh, maybe at some point in January, those benefits will not be available. So depending on who you are and where you fall in, in either of those camps, be prepared to either have your benefits, just stop the end of the year and know that there will not be any extension coming. You will, you'll stop getting unemployment payments uh, or know that you'll be in a situation where if you were originally told uh, when you received a determination letter from your state, your state's unemployment agency that, look, you're going to get unemployment benefits until X and such date, know that your benefits may actually stop earlier. Okay, and they may stop earlier because, again, the originally projected date may have been past those 
initial 26 weeks that your state would have given you and actually maybe part of that 13 week extension period. Um, that is the PEUC, uh, Pandemic Unemployment Compen uh, Pandemic Employment unemployment compensation, the PEUC, I believe, uh, program. So what I advise you to do, hear me out. If you were unsure, or if you think you're sure, or if you know you're sure, just I would advise you, if you were in a state uh, that has not had any problems with people being able to contact their unemployment agency, call, see if you can find out, hey, um, on dis the last week of the year, what, uh, December 26, whatever, uh, will I be, you know, utilizing my regular unemployment benefits that, that those initial weeks, or will I be uh, in the PEUC uh, program? I advise you to find out this way, you will not be surprised if your benefits just stop, or you, or if you have planned uh, for your benefits to last you maybe until February or whenever, uh, be advised that, hey, you know, my benefits are actually going to just stop beforehand. So call if you have, if you're, if you're not, if, in a, if you're in an area where you're able to get through. I know that there, there are some states where people cannot get through. You know, I've heard unfortunate stories where people have called for hours, right? And they are just not able to get through. And so if you are in that type of situation, what I advise you to do, if you're not able to get through, whether, you know, you've had that unfortunate experience yourself, or if it's been a situation where you, you know, have heard that people can't get through, try to take another means of finding out. Maybe that means reaching out to your local elected officials. Not obviously, they wouldn't be able to, you know, find out for you specifically. But if they get enough calls from constituents asking about this, they will reach out more likely than not to your unemployment agency and ask them uh, or kind of urge them to put out some sort of notice, right? So that way you can have some sort of general idea. Um, I might also advise if you don't want to kind of go that route, try and scour your uh, agency's website to see if they can provide you with some sort of guidance. But again, the key, the key thing here, both of those options are not really ideal because what I want for you specifically right? You've endured enough. Your family has endured enough. You don't have a family because we always make it seem like families are the only people who experience hardship. Single people experience hardship all the time. No matter who you are as an American, most likely you've dealt with some form of hardship. And you, if you don't have to deal with the hardship of not knowing specifically trauma coming to your specific econ economy, um, that's ideal, you know, and again, having you reach out to an elected official who can't tell you anything about you specifically or looking at a website, which really won't tell you anything about you specifically, you know, it's not ideal. Uh, but if you have to go that route, do it. If you are confident in your counting skills, like if you could one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, consider going onto your state's website, finding out the number of weeks that they offer, and then going on to your um, going on to your uh, actual account on on the unemployment website, finding out when your claim started and counting one, two, three, four, five, six. So do what you think you know will work for you. But again, if you can preferably put yourself in a situation where you're able to call, try and do that because that will be the easiest things to do. Um, now, we have seen from some states, they have actually tried to take matters into their own hands and they have actually said, look, we're just going to go ahead and we are on our, our own dime going to increase the um, benefit period uh, and pay people longer than we otherwise would. That's a noble thing right? That's a very noble thing. Um, but here's the deal in the words of our president elect, here's the deal. As, as much as they are doing this, you know, as some people would say out of the kindness of their hearts, it's not really that it's because they understand that the impact on the economy is too great for them not to do it. Um, but 
the deal is they need money to do it. They can't pay you with IOUs. They can't pay you with monopoly money. They actually need money to do this. And so um, this is why, uh, as you know, some people are opposed to, which I don't understand, this is why we have people like Nancy Pelosi saying, look, we've got to pay people money, right? Obviously, yes, states need to pay, you know, workers they need to pay firefighters yada 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 so on and so forth but you have to understand it also helps them provide extra benefits that that their constituents need such as this now uh as 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 much as we can talk about the fact that very few states have actually kind of stepped up to the plate and said look you know we don't we barely have the money, but we're going to do this on our own dime for now, and hopefully we'll be reimbursed later or whatever the case might be. You also have some states who have said, look, we're just not going to do anything, right? And maybe they don't do anything because their local, in, in the eyes of their leadership, their their local economy isn't that bad, right? And it's like, oh, it's not that bad that we have many, many people who are about to be evicted. It's not that bad. Obviously, you know, um, uh, Politics is like other kind of avenues of life where people really don't see the impact of things until it impacts them personally, right? And so it's unfortunate that some leaders can be like that because they can eat every night because their children aren't suffering because, you know, their bank account isn't really, uh, you know, losing value. Um, you know, they're not, they're, they don't really understand what has happened to you, whether they just literally don't have the capacity to understand because of the fortunate situation they happen to be in or could just be because they just genuinely just don't want to understand. But whatever the case might be, there are some politicians who have made the call that even if the funds are available, they are not going to do anything to help their people because in their minds, again, the economy is not that bad. Um, and Or if they see that things are bad, they just may say, look, the there's not a political benefit. I've talked about before, again, when we look at what has happened uh, with our failure to actually get economic stimulus passed in this session where we've now just come to a lame duck session, uh, we see what's happened with the Senate Republicans, specifically Republicans who were not up for re-election. Those Senate Republicans run on being, and I'm using air quotes, fiscal conservatives. <laughs> And when they run on being fiscal conservatives, uh, if they're not up for re-election, they have to project this kind of image of being fiscally conservative. So it's not politically expedient to appear to be anything but fiscally conservative if they don't have to pay the price for not doing what's in the best interest of the people. Hopefully you understand what I meant by that. So, um, you know, and, and, and look, when we overall look at these different states kind of doing different things, we need a unified approach. Obviously, certain states are dealing with other issues that other states aren't, whether because of size, demographics, whatever. I get that. But just how, for instance, we should have a national mask mandate because it's not like COVID in the air just stops at the state lines. Uh, at, the, at, at the same point, um, because we have kind of a national economy, as important as individual states' economies are, they all make up our national economy. And we can't have some states being robust and others kind of being super lackluster and barely hobbling by. So we have to do what works and we have to help, you know, all these states. But anywho, I'm going to end on this. Just consider what we have tried and what we've tried has not worked, right? We've tried not having a national uh, kind of plan for dealing with COVID and we've tried not having a, you know, that plan has not been national when it comes to dealing with the pandemic itself or the economy. What has worked and what hasn't? Let's, let's look at that. Let's be smart about what we decide to do going forward. Another program that has been stimulating the economy that is going to immediately stop stimulating our economy is the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program. This is the program, uh, and, and it actually frequently got confused with the PEUC, which I just talked about. The PEUC was the program that gave actual extra weeks to unemployment. The PUA program was the program that 
qualified people for unemployment who typically did not qualify, your self-employed people, your contractors, your gig workers. So those people are going to stop getting their unemployment at the end of the year. Unlike the PEUC, I think these people, the PUA people are in a better position because uh, pretty much for all of them, when they signed up for unemployment, they knew when their benefits would end. Like they knew, okay, unless something happens, unless we get more stimulus uh, on this specific date, this is when I lose my unemployment benefits, right? With the PEUC program that I just talked about, uh, that potentially it actually helped both uh, PUA and regular unemployment people. Um, well, I think it did more to um, help the regular unemployment people, and just in kind of my opinion. But so when you, I'm sorry, I kind of got distracted, kind of dealing with something or looking at something. But so the that program is ending, right? And so regardless if you kind of, you know, figure that it is more, you know, that these people are more lucky because maybe, I don't know, who knows. Uh, but what I will say is this, I've talked about before the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program. A lot of people, especially when both of these programs were rolled out, they were confused because they technically could have qualified for both programs. For instance, if you have, for instance, a, a an Uber driver, a gig worker, uh, they technically could have qualified both for PUA as well as for the PPP. But a lot of people didn't know initially that technically they should not have double dipped and tried to get both the unemployment and the PPP. Uh, what I will say is this, I, I obviously, you know, most people have taken advantage at this point of either or, but I will say this, uh, the PPP was more beneficial to those that either as self-employed, a contractor or a gig worker made a lot of money, right? They actually uh, operated more as a business, but the PUA kind of benefited those who maybe, yeah, they technically were classified as, as those things, but they didn't make so much money, right? So I will say this, the PUA was definitely effective, right? Those people typically made um, money on a consistent basis that really was on par with what the average worker did. They didn't make a whole lot more, but what I will say is that those that were on PPP made a lot more. That was probably one of the least effective forms of stimulus. And I think that Congress going forward needs to rethink an alternative because I think that they don't need to make the mistake and try and lump both of these groups of people in together. So unemployment received a lot of assistance uh, under the CARES Act. We've talked about the PUA program. We've talked about PEUC. Uh, but another form of, um, actually, no, hold up. Wait a minute. Um, I'm not sure. I just kind of had kind of a revelation. Uh, the, the, there was another form of um, stimulus that unemployment kind of received, which were the extra, it was the, ex the extra payment those on, on unemployment were receiving. Now, I understand it's been a while since people have heard of this, uh, received it, and where I'm having a little bit of confusion is, I believe this is what the PEUC is. I don't know. I don't know. I, you know, I'm, I'm having a moment. I'm still drinking my coffee. But anywho, so this was where 
this was kind of a hot button issue in the beginning. I don't know if you remember. Those who were receiving unemployment benefits were receiving an extra $600 per week in addition to their state benefits. Uh, then that dried up, I believe it was July 30th. Then you had a situation where um, the president, COVID in chief, President Trump, signed an executive memo that actually started paying people uh, not $600 a week, but $300 a week in addition to what they were receiving. Now, for some states, they ended up getting six weeks of payments. Some states got five weeks of payments. And we did have one state that declined payments altogether. Now, the expectation here was that ultimately Congress would get itself together. They would end up... Um, you know, paving the way to an agreement where um, even though the $300 per week would stop, people would get some sort of compensation again, and then it would be backdated to, you know, a previous state. That did not happen. But what I actually want to note about this is that this is one of those things where um, for most people, this has stopped anyways, right? The 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 $600 stopped back in July, but then you also had, for most states, the $300 have already expired if they were already paid. Like they stopped like a month or two ago. Uh, now you have some states that are, that they were really behind the ball. Like they really fumbled it for their people. And I hope that their uh, constituents hold their elected officials uh, uh, responsible. Um, but they really fumbled the ball and they either are still now paying because they didn't start paying until like literally a week or two ago. Some people, um, I, I, I don't know if there's anyone who has not yet started receiving payments who was supposed to, but like 90% of people have already exhausted the benefits. Some people are still getting them, but it's because they, not because they got more, but simply because their state literally just started paying them. But so that said, another thing that I want to note about this is the fact that, especially as you consider uh, the recent election of President-elect Joe Biden, um, you, you're really seeing a lot of people demonize Trump. I have demonized I'm I have demonized him several times during the this this podcast episode, right? I've called him COVID in chief. Um but I want you to consider something, right? Um consider like for instance, I call President COVID in chief, COVID in chief because he is doing everything in his power to promote and spread COVID here in the United States. He's working against scientists. He, you know, is actively out there infecting people, you know, well, he did when he had COVID, he made sure that his White House harbored COVID. So that way it could be like the leading, the number one greatest, best hotspot to get COVID. Uh, you know, he wanted to make the White House great again, right? Uh, but look, here's the deal. Like, when it comes to demonizing Trump, and saying that he did not want to provide economic stimulus, this is where I have to disagree with a lot of people, especially people who happen to be on the left when they say this. And I understand it could either be coming from when people say, well, look, President Trump didn't want to give economic stimulus. I believe that it's one of two things, that one of two reasons why they say this. They either say this because they don't understand that that's factually not true, um, or they say it because they understand that it is, that it's not true, but because they think that it benefits them to say that, right? We talked about how it benefited Republicans to take on the Tea Partiers and stuff like that. They looked at the short-term game. And I think that the Democrats could be doing themselves kind of a disservice if they continue to spread the narrative that Donald Trump was the problem with stimulus. Keep in mind, Donald Trump, he's on his way out. Right. So do you really have anything to gain if you continue to kind of bash him specifically for this? I understand every administration likes to talk about the sins of the previous administration and they talk about what I inherited. And yeah, that might be factually correct. But look, again, in the words of our president elect, here's the deal. When it comes to economic stimulus, Donald Trump actually tried. He for one, he understood what he had to gain 
by getting economic stimulus out there, right? And I say all the time, don't just look at what a person says. Don't listen to that. That that doesn't matter. Look at what they actually do, right? Uh, and to his credit, Donald Trump didn't just say, oh, I want stimulus, give me stimulus. He actually he, as I said, he did that, right? Like, dude did that. Like, he, 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 he got her done, right? He, he did that, and he did that with, withstanding the constraints that he had to contend with. Everyone knows that the power of the purse lies with Congress. So, could he sit out there and? alone by his lonesome as COVID in chief, just sign out new checks? No, he couldn't. And anyone who would tell you that is like telling you a lie. Could he just give $600 or $300 a week by his lonesome uh, to people? No. And you might say, well, Brittany, he, he got us the three, if you were on unemployment, he got us the $300 a week. He did that because he reallocated funds that had already been kind of issued, right? It's kind of like when you say you have, uh, and, and they were issued for a specific purpose, right? He couldn't just take money out of the, the hypothetical bank account of the nation and decide to give it to you and me. He had to take money that was already apportioned to go out to people under cons uh, under specific circumstances. And that's what he did. That's how he was able to do something. And he didn't do that out of the kindness of his heart, right? I'm not arguing that he gave us stimulus because he genuinely cared about the American people. We know, as they say, we know the devil the devil we were dealing with. We, we knew what we had when we had him, while we still have him, right? Um, but he did what he did because it was politically expedient and he understood he was up for re-election and a lot of people were hurting and people, they are impacted by what they're personally dealing with, right? Just like I said, most people don't care about political issues until they're personally affected. People out there, you, you hear story after story after story about People saying, oh, I didn't take coronavirus seriously, or I was a, I didn't wear masks, or I was a COVID denier, and I was da 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 until they catch it, their family members catch it, and then next thing you know, they're on the news giving us a story about how you need to wise up, listen up, not saying that that's wrong because you're allowed to change your mind and people shouldn't be demonized for that, but in the words of the president, it is what it is, right? So look, so when it comes to that, though, uh, it's wrong to think that President Trump did not want to give stimulus. Again, not because he said, I want to give you stimulus, but when you actually look at what he did, he actually, he did more to give us stimulus than Senate Republicans did. That's actually saying a lot, not about him, but about Senate Republicans. It says a whole heap of a lot. Like, are you, that man did more than COVID and Chief did more for America than you? Wow. Wow. Right. So he wanted to get stimulus. So he was not the problem. The Senate Republicans and not all Senate Republicans were the problem. The problem were the Senate Republicans who were not up for reelection. And that was a sizable lot enough that they were able to keep anything in the in the Senate from going forward. Keep in mind. Not only did President Trump give us the lost wages assistance program, which he by his lonesome did with the executive memo, he actually said, and I know we can't, you know, believe a lot of what he says, but when I couple it with what he actually did, I'm more prone to believe that he meant this. And because it self served his own personal political uh, political uh, motives, uh, I believe that when he said that he wanted something bigger, it's because he understood that the American people were crying out against what the Republicans were trying to give us, which was a targeted, a.k.a. smaller package than what people actually needed. One that actually didn't give people a $1,200 check. That's why he said, I want to know some bigger, the bigger or best of this package is this you ever had. Right. That's why we heard that. That's why. And look, as here's the, here's the thing. Man, man, oh man, oh man. And, and you can make the argument, well, look, he's the president. He should have been able to wrangle his party. 
One, it's not his party. We talked about that before. He is part of something completely different that has hijacked the Republican Party, whose responsibility it actually was to wrangle the Republicans together was Mitch McConnell. He failed. That is why he is blah, right? I'm, I'm just, he's just blah. <laughs> like, like, I just, I want to just like, just say something. So I'm just gonna say he's blah, right? And so because he's just blah, he fumbled the ball. It was Mitch McConnell's responsibility. He fumbled it more than the president. People, Trump should have wrangled in the, Trump schmump. He couldn't have done a diggly dog lawn thing. You know what I mean? Like, I'm like Ned Flanders trying to curse, right? Doggone it. Dag I don't know what he said. That was Simpsons so long ago. I haven't seen an episode, but anyways. So, um, look, it was Mitch McConnell. He, he fumbled, he fadangled it. it. It didn't happen. It fadoodled under Mitch McConnell. And because of that, again, all of that considered, Trump wasn't the problem. Trump was Trump and all of his shenanigans were not the problem. So so stop blaming Trump because again, and I know I was talking about that six hundred dollars and stuff, and I went off on another tangent, but Trump actually tried to help people. So when you hear again, whether it's people from the left or even those trying to take their party back and kind of blame Trump, don't believe the BS because Trump actually tried when you consider. He tried to do something in terms of stimulus, maybe not early on, but eventually when he saw that, yo, like Americans are calling out for this, this can be politically advantageous to me. He tried. He just couldn't do it. And we all know when you understand how politics works, he couldn't have done it by himself. Okay. But look, I want you to consider when you consider all of that, and I'm going to end my tangent here, that <clears throat> when you consider this narrative with the election of President-elect Joe Biden, when you consider the narrative that we're hearing from not all, but a sizable majority on the left, when you're hearing them talk about how we have taken our politics back, back to politicians, back from this TV, they're not calling them an impersonator, but a, what's a reality TV person. I don't watch a lot of TV. I don't know what they call these people, right? For, when we've taken our uh, politics back and they they kind of construe this as a victory for politicians, the old guard of politics. I, I really caution them against that. I really caution them against that because look, when President Trump, when COVID in chief was elected, he was elected based on an idea. And that shouldn't be surprising because his predecessor was elected on an idea, on several ideas, matter of fact. His, pre his predecessor was elected on the idea of, you know, the first of, of many, right? The first uh, African-American, the first yada, yada, yada. He was elected specifically on the idea of change. That was his mantle. Right. And so it's actually it's kind of funny when you consider Trump, uh, because when you, when you consider President Trump and his elect his bid for election initially, it actually was a rip off, a negative rip off in terms of framing of Obama. Right. Obama ran on an idea, an idea of hope and change and we can do and yes, we can and si se puede, puede and da, da, da. you know what I mean? Like he, he ran on all of that hopefulness, not saying that it was bad. It worked. It was what we needed at the time. And, you know, um, I've referenced before how Nancy Pelosi, especially when you look at the negotiations, she tried to train, chain, put that into like a hope and change perspective and was like, look, Nancy, it worked in 2008, but it is not working again, right? But so President Trump, COVID in chief, actually did the same thing when he ran four years ago and it worked for him. So it should not be surprising that he was elected 
because his thing wasn't hope and change as Obama framed it, but it was hope and change as he framed it. Mike, drop when you really understand that, when you really get that as much as as COVID in chief bombed on Obama and dogged him and talked about him and questioned him. When you look at what he did, he he did the same thing. He hoped and changed it all the way to the White House. But his hope and change was not a politician who was promising hope and change. He was an outsider who was promising hope and change. But here's what I want to caution the Democrats against, because let me get back to this point so I can end this here. The Democrats, they have, since Saturday, I've seen several times, I've seen pundits talk about, you know, oh, you know, we've taken our politics back and it's especially Morning Joe, right? I, I love, well, I don't want to say I love, but I've, I've come to actually like it and appreciate it in the past. I really couldn't tolerate it too much, especially, you know, back in the day before Mika and Joe were married. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, I feel like I'm almost watching soft porn. Right. So, um, <laughs> anyways, so it was, like, it was like a pol- like kind of like a political thing going on. And then like the way she would like look, but anyway, anyways, anyways, anyways. So we, we I've, I've heard this narrative in the last few days where it's like, Oh, thank God, we're going to have an adult back in the room. It's a politician. Thank God. And I think, yes, a lot of people feel like that, but I want you to understand that as as much as people have come to see what Trump really was, where he sold them on hope and change four years ago, and he is not what they expected. Like when you go to the store and you buy something, or you like to see you see an infomercial, and then you see something, and you order it, and you're like. You pick it up right out the box and you're like, okay, it looked like it was quality, but it feels super cheap. Like somebody made it, you know what I mean? Like, like that, like you instantly have that buyer's remorse. For some people, it was instant with COVID in chief. With others, it took a while. But at the end of the day, most people ended up at that place of buyer's remorse. What I want to caution the Democrats about is this. When we look at what happened with Trump, I said before that this recent election was not so much as much as a lot of people, myself included, appreciate Joe Biden, both as a human and as a, and as a politician, this election was not so much a, uh, a dire, just cry out as a nation for Joe Biden. It was more against the re-election of Trump. A, a lot of people said, look, our buyer's remorse is enough to where even if I don't exactly want Joe Biden, he is better than what we currently have, right? And so what I want to caution the Democrats uh, to, to kind of be aware about is the fact that Just as much as people were able to get that buyer's remorse with Trump, I want to caution you that not only are they able to get it with the old guard that's coming in with President-elect Joe Biden, I want to make it aware, make you aware that their buyer's remorse is going to be even more quick to occur if you allow it to set in. And that needs to be top of mind because just how we've, even in Joe Biden's, President-elect Joe Biden's acceptance speech, how he's talked about, for instance, his plan to, I don't know at this point, you know, it's 1040 my time, if he's announced his team of scientists and so on and so forth, he plans to hit the ground running. He really, his administration cannot fumble the ball. Because, yes, some people, for instance, with COVID in chief, with President Trump, they, some people immediately kind of got buyer's remorse, but for a lot of people, it kind of happened over time. I am guaranteeing you that the American people are not going to afford 
Joe Biden and his administration as much time to potentially get buyer's remorse. So, I mean, and this goes beyond the times that we're living in, right? We're already dealing with COVID and you have to have a certain level of excellence excellence from the moment you set foot in the White House. But even beyond that, you have to live up to this higher standard because what you are likely to do is if you go, if if the Biden administration goes in there, they fumble the ball. Obviously, you're going to have some people who have buyer's remorse. You can't get away from that. You're not going to make everybody happy. That's okay. So what? You just have to walk away with not making enough people unhappy and enough people have buyer's remorse to get you out, right? But so with, with Joe Biden and President-elect Joe Biden and his administration, if the unfortunate hypothetical occurs where he fumbles the ball and a lot of people end up with buyer's remorse, how people were willing to take a chance on a Donald Trump before, they are not only more quickly going to be willing to do it again, but it is going to uh, not just re-energize, but also validate, revalidate, I don't know if it's a, if that's a word, but it's going to reinforce the decision that they had before. And what they might end up with is a kind of a, a complacency where it's like, well, look, you know what? Politics, it just is what it is. The people suck. You know, we're never going to be able to do it. And then so good luck trying to turn people out again in, in the record numbers that you had this time right? This was like, like, literally, this was that one shot that you cannot, you cannot F it up. I really don't curse, but again, you, you can't F it up. You, you cannot. In some people's minds, at some point somewhere, you're going to F it up. It is what it is, but you can't F it up for enough people that they are willing to say never again. I will always take a chance on an outsider. The old and the new, when you compare the two, a lot of people, they look at this and say, see, they tried the new and it didn't work and we're back up in there. You're back up in there, but the standard is raised higher. And this is why I say, when I when I talked earlier about how President-elect Joe Biden is the right man for this time because he's a centrist and he was the only centrist that we had at the time, this is why I tell you, as many people are, for instance, mad at Nancy Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi, she is, this is not the time to remove her from her post. Yes, she's extreme in a lot of ways, but when you consider the people around her, when you consider her current caucus, she is, she has the political power that they don't yet have that is necessary at this time. You cannot separate, when you, when you have two things going for the Democrats at this time that lie in two people. Nancy Pelosi is a political powerhouse. Joe Biden, he's a powerhouse in his own right, but what he mainly brings to this the, 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 to this table at this point is his level of political centrism. The centrism being in the center coupled with the powerhouse of Nancy Pelosi is what we need. I like Joe Biden, but by himself, I'm not sure that he could withstand in a lot of ways politically that Nancy Pelosi has proven time and time and time again that she can. She's gone toe to toe with some beasts. And I think on the flip side, if you leave Nancy Pelosi alone, and if we would have had that political powerhouse, but the powerhouse coupled with the far left, where the Democratic Party is trying to go, that also would have been a place of danger. Independently, Nancy Pelosi as a political powerhouse cannot stand. Independently, Joe Biden as a political centrist cannot stand. You need both. So if you are a Democrat, I caution you. You've already spoken and you've already said, look, we want Joe Biden. I, I get that. But this question around Nancy Pelosi and removing her from leadership, I caution you not to do it. I caution you not to do it. Not saying that there are not other political powerhouses on the left, but she is who you need, especially 
uh, boy, just just she's she's what you need. She she is what you need if you've ever needed anything like anything before. So that said, that said, the old and the new. You know, uh, it, 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 Democrats they they can't mess this up. So I'm 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 going to leave this here because I've been I've been rambling long enough. Americans were protected earlier this year or earlier, um, when did that happen? Like in September, um, not earlier in the year, just a few months ago, they received protection from protection that they had that, that ended. What the heck am I talking about? Well, um, under the CARES Act, uh, you know, we're talking about different forms of stimulus and how they're coming to an end. Well, this form of stimulus had actually come to an end, but then it was kind of revived. Under the CARES Act, um, there were limited, not sweeping, but limited protection uh, against tenants being evicted, right? And and the protection basically benefited only uh, homes that had federally backed mortgage loans or households that received some type of federal funding. Um, the protections actually ended, uh, in September and, or excuse me, they, they ended, but then what ended up happening was in September, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, um, as kind of odd, odd as it was to some people, um, and we've actually seen lawsuits, you know, where people have tried to say, look, this is kind of like not within their jurisdiction, but the CDC came along and they said, look, um, we've got a halt on evictions because, you know, yes, people can't pay rent, but we have a, p- a pandemic that's going on, right? Um, now, what I will say about this is this. Obviously, we're this, this, uh, I'm talking about uh, forms of stimulus that are going to be gone come December 31st, right? This is included in that. But I want to mention something. I, uh, at the top of the show, talked about, the, the top of this podcast episode, I talked about how we talk about businesses closing. We even talked about businesses kind of doing bankruptcy and restructuring, but we really haven't talked much as a country about personal bankruptcies that have either started happening or that are about to start happening so people can get protection from eviction. And this is one of the things that I really think politicians need to consider because unless they come along and they rewrite these bankruptcy laws, even if they decide uh, that, hey, we're going to do stimulus again, and they decide, well, look, we're not going to protect from eviction because these people are going to end up getting evicted anyways because they're not going to have a lump sum of money to pay. If they didn't get a lump sum of money, they literally have to understand. They need to take into consideration that even if you don't provide via economic stimulus uh, uh, protection against evictions, you are still going to be affording stitu- a constituents a, a protection against evictions in the form of the bankruptcy laws that we have on the books at the moment. And so some people aren't aware of the protections that they can be afforded, and some people are. Some people will come to know about these protections. And that said, again, you know, we're having this national discussion about, oh my gosh, a whole slew of people are going to have $5,000 plus worth of rent all due at once that they can't pay because they were banking on a stimulus check. They were banking on being able to get a job. They were banking on this, that, and the other. Whatever the case is, they were banking on it. They don't have it. They missed the shot, unlike our ex-president, President Barack Obama. Did you see he made that shot? It was wonderful, right? If you don't know what I'm referencing, oh well. <laughs> so, um, look, we are we are on the verge of not just this eviction crisis, but a bankruptcy crisis. And I think that this is something that needs to be talked about, right? Um, I, I'm not seeing enough political discussion around this. You know, we're talking about, oh my gosh, they need to, you know, get uh, eviction protections and da 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 da. But bankruptcy is, it, and and it, it's it goes beyond, like, even when you talk about bankruptcy on a personal level, it's not about protections that consumers can be afforded. It's also about the impact that it has on them long term. 
right? And so, you know, we talk about this, the economic stimulus and, oh, the economy isn't going to rebound until 2023, 2024, whatever. But for a lot of people on a very personal level, their personal economies, especially if they have to go the route of bankruptcy, isn't going to rebound for, what is it, seven years, 10 years? I don't know. I've never filed bankruptcy. No idea. But I know it's a long time. Do we want to do that to a sizable uh, portion of Americans? Like, do we really want to do that? Is there an alternative? There may not be, but at the very least, I want us to question, have we done enough? Have we had enough discussion around this to at least look like we're trying to figure it out? Because we have to figure it out because it's not just an eviction crisis. As much as those who are into real estate and invested in real estate would like to frame it as a, oh, real estate, it's beyond that. It's, it's beyond that. And we need to think about it. The final piece of uh, stimulus that I want to talk about during this episode that I really haven't talked about um, really at all, I don't think, when I consider previous podcast episodes, um, is student loan deferrals, right? Those are disappearing. Okay. Um, a lot of us may not be aware of this because we're not actively students. We are, you know, not assisting students and paying, you know what I mean? Like, so we have no idea. Um, again, I mentioned earlier that we're all kind of ignorant about something that's okay. Uh, and to expect yourself to know everything, like that's not okay. You'll never know everything, right? Like we all, don't know something. Um, but here's the deal. If you don't know, I'm about to help you know. Um, students, what they have been doing, um, if they've been responsible for paying off student loans, under the CARES Act, one of the things that they've received is was a reprieve that basically gave them the option, again, it was an option, um, to defer their loan payments. Basically, um, they got to put their payments off until a later date. But in addition to that, it, it, it wasn't like, okay, you get to put your payments off, but you're still accruing interest. There was also a pause to the accrual of the interests associated with those loans. And this was done until September. Right. So this was yet another one of those things where, you know, I know we're talking in this episode about stuff ending December 31st. This like that six hundred dollars per week that people were getting. This was one of those things that kind of went on a little bit beyond that time, the time of July 31st. But for everybody, it basically had, you know, was supposed to stop. That was until. President Trump, he stepped in and he extended the deferment until December 31st. And and I and I want to point this out because I mentioned earlier that we see there are a lot of ways in which you can demonize President Trump, right? And I'm like, again, uh, you've heard me call him several times and I will probably continue to call him for the rest of my life, COVID in chief, uh, because I think that he's absolutely doing everything he can to spread COVID-19. And we can't claim it from his perspective that is from a point of ignorance because one, he has access to vast amount of information and, uh, and um, you know, people that we don't have access to. And then he also told him, uh, told us himself, he has the biggest, bestest brain ever created. Uh, and he did the biggest and bestest that he ever could do and that anyone could ever do on that memory test or whatever it was. You don't even remember because my their brain isn't his greatest hit. So given his own admission of the greatness of his brain and the fact that he has access to so much information, he cannot claim ignorance um, about COVID-19, which is again, why I call him COVID in chief, but anywho. So, um, you know, as much as people can demonize him, myself included, one thing that I think that none of us, when we consider what he has done, not just what he has said, again, he stepped out, he gave us the LWA for people who were on uh, unemployment. He gave us that for people who were paying student loans. He gave us uh, an extension of the deferment on um, the student loans. So he's done a lot for us, even if we haven't directly benefited, even if you know we're not on unemployment, even if we're not students, as a collective, he has done this for our economy, right? And 
he has taken actions independently that he could take. Yes, he could have taken more, but at least he's he, he's done this, right? He could have not done it. He could have said, look, let the students sink, right? I didn't provide him with a stimulus check, so let me just, why why defer their loans to just, just it is what it is, right? He could have done that, but he didn't. So we have to give credit where kind of credit is due. At least he tried to, again, this was kind of a, another way in which COVID in chief tried to get people stimulus to his credit, uh, but also for his own political advantage. <laughs> It's fall, and you know what that means, right? <laughs> you can find us on Facebook. No, I know that fall and Facebook have nothing to do with each other, but they both start with the letter F. So, according to my logic, perfect time to tell you about finding us on Facebook since it is fall. Isn't that exceptional logic? By my point of view, it is. Anywho, in the description box below, you'll find a link to our Facebook page. Check us out. If you like us, like our page. We'll be more than glad to have you. Again, find us on Facebook. Look in the description box below for the link. Hey, this is Brittany. Just wanted to shoot you a quick reminder. Look in the description box of this episode and you can find a link to our website. On our website, you can find our latest blog posts. You can find our contact information. If you even want to make a contribution, you can go over there and do that as well. You can find out the policies we are looking at and targeting as an organization. You know, I say all the time that we are a tax exempt political organization. If you want to know more about that, Again, go on over to our website, our-pack.com, where you can find out everything you want to know. You can do everything you want to do. We will gladly, gladly, gladly welcome you on our website with open arms. Again, check out our website in the description box below. All right, guys, so this has been, I told you at the top of the show that this would be a pretty long podcast episode, so don't say that I didn't warn you. I totally did, <laughs> but uh, we, we covered a lot here, you know, and I want you to walk away with a few things. I want you to walk away understanding that, you know, in, in whatever form of stimulus you have been able to participate in, in stimulating our economy, um, no that you know as as a collective our economy is going to be stimulated for fewer than two months um after two months we have no stimulus left and we've already seen what happens when the kind of you know programs of stimulus kind of trickle out but now we're at a point where it is um completely gonna be gone so consider that know that that's what we're dealing with those 13 weeks of unemployment that you know people have been getting those are going to be gone even if on the books in your portal you should have more sorry about that i should have turned off that notification but that's going to be gone know that um those of you who have qualified for unemployment that typically wouldn't qualify unless there's an extension that's going to be gone for you uh know that look you know i'm pretty sure we should probably get some form of extra money for those on unemployment but we don't know what we're going to be dealing with especially since we're going to be contending with a republican senate who knows right we're losing eviction protections um even those those were uh, extended by the cdc we're going to be seeing the student loan deferrals come to an end, even though President Trump extended those to the 31st of December. We've got a lot that's ending, right? Um, it's like we're closing when it, it's, it's, I don't even know how to describe it. A lot is ending. We have the presidency of, of COVID in chief is ending. We've got our disastrous 2020 for a lot of people ending, um, 
And we don't know what we're going into. We don't know if, you know, President-elect Joe Biden is going to, going to be better. Chances are he will be. We don't know if 2021 is going to be better. Chances are it will be. But, you know, it. it we're just... Uh, there's a lot that's ending. This is a time of end, right? And and I really don't know how else to describe it, you know? But so that said, since we're speaking of endings, I'm going to go ahead and stop talking before I keep rambling as I have done at various points during the show. So thank you for tuning in. I hope that you took some information away if you didn't know certain things about um, stimulus as we've, you know, approached the end of the year. If this wasn't helpful to you, hopefully it's helpful to somebody that you know and you can share this information with them again if you know if they're on unemployment or if they're a student or if they're, you know, uh, if they've been able to stay in their residence despite, uh, you know, um, the fact that they probably should be evicted given an inability to pay kind of what we'd see in, you know, typical times. I don't know. But share this with somebody. Um, if, if you don't want to share the entire episode, cause I'm sure it was lengthy, uh, you can, you know, share certain aspects, you know, say, Hey, listen to this podcast, start at, you know, two minutes and 30 seconds or 23 minutes, whatever the case was the point where you think that they would find useful information to them. So thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Um, I don't know if it's, you know, if anybody else is feeling this. But I promise you, like, and I'm like, not even like kidding, literally Saturday, the air felt different on me. The sun shined brighter. It felt better on my skin. And like, just, I'm feeling like this air of just like newness and relief. And I'm, I'm loving it. I'm, I'm, da, 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 da. I'm loving it, right? <laughs> So any of you guys have a great day. Thank you for listening. You've been listening to another episode of our Pack Politics podcast. My name is Brittany McDowell. I love you. Stay safe. Stay sane. Wear your hazmat suit because it is not safe. We are hitting a record number of cases per day. I know that we are supposed to be making America great again, but we are not trying to win a race to make America great again by the most number of COVID cases. And I know that COVID in chief would like us to be doing that, but that is not the plan. We have taken our country back and I'm looking forward to making our country great again. So have a great day, guys. Goodbye.